Welcome. Great to see everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Ben Cook. I am a faculty member here at the law school and director of the BYU Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Um, I want to uh, I want to begin by thanking a, a few people who have done a lot of work to help make the event possible. Uh, Leanne Glade is the assistant director at the center, and uh, she's uh, put in a lot of time and uh, effort uh, to make this all possible. And then we have. Um, we have three student fellows, uh, Daniela Linga, Tyler Martin, and Sarah Fletcher, who have also uh, put forth a lot of work, and then also Candace and Autumn and, and our events team here at the law school, really grateful for their efforts and grateful for the uh, uh, Dean Smith and, and the deanery here for, for supporting our, our efforts at the center. The center is um, located over in the Wilkinson Center. Um, it, it's, uh, it's on the fourth floor, and uh, our mission is to inspire peace on campus and throughout the world. And uh, our, our event today is, is one way that we try to do that. Um, the, uh, the Peacemaker Award was created in memory of Eugene England, who was a BYU English professor uh, a number of years ago. And um, he was a deeply kind, loving uh, person and a tireless advocate of dialogue and peace. Um, he uh, passed away uh, back in 2001 after uh, battling cancer. Um, and we uh, hold this event annually uh, in, in, uh, in his memory. Um, back in 1993 at St. James Catholic Church in Las Vegas, uh, Professor England gave a speech at an event called a Mormon, uh, a Mormon Peace Gathering. And in, in the speech, he cited a First Presidency Christmas message from 1981. Uh, and and uh, this is what, this is what uh, they said. To all who seek a resolution to conflict, be it a misunderstanding between individuals or an international difficulty among nations. We commend the counsel of the Prince of Peace. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Um, they go on to say, this principle of loving one another will bring, bring peace to the individual, to the home, and beyond, even to the nations and to the world. Um, so, um, I, it, it's an honor to, to introduce uh, Dr. Salah. Before we do that, uh, as we, as is a tradition here at, at BYU, we start with prayer and, and Daniela Linga, a second year law student um, and student fellow at the Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution will give us a prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity to gather here today. We are grateful for the opportunity to hear from Dr. Salah and to um, hear about her experiences and to learn from her. We are so grateful for her example and the things that she's taught all over the world. And we ask that we can um, be receptive to those things. We are so grateful for the things that bring us together to serve and uplift those around us and the people of the world. And we ask that we can enjoy this time to get today together and um, be mutually ed educated by what we will hear. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So um, it, it, it's such a great honor to have Dr. Salah on our campus. And um, if if you look at um, you, you know just just reading through. Um, all of her accomplishments would be an event in and of itself. Uh, so I, I, I'm just going to highlight uh, a few of those. Um, so a Jordanian native, Dr. Salah has worked tirelessly as an advocate for women's and children's rights, especially in conflict and post-conflict <coughs> situations. She has nearly 30 years of professional experience at the United Nations in countries around the world, including but not limited to Burkina Faso, Chad, Central African Republic, Pakistan, and Vietnam. She holds a PhD in cultural anthropology from the State University of New York at Binghamton, master's degrees in education, sociology, and cultural anthrop anthropology from SUNY Fredonia, and an undergraduate degree in sociology and social work from the Lebanese American University. Um, Dr. Salah currently serves as chair of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. She sits on the board of directors at Women for Women International, the Global Network for Women Peace Builders, and Cure Violence Global. She's also a member of the Secretary General High Level Panel on Peace Operations. Dr. Salah is the recipient of numerous honors and awards from countries around the globe. Uh, we give the Peacemaker Award as a bonsai tree. 
And as we explain each year, bonsai trees are beautiful, um, but they don't just happen. They require a lot of care, work, and attention, and patience, and we think that's a really fitting metaphor for peace building. So please join me in welcoming and honoring Dr. Salah, the 2021 Peacemaker of the Year Award. Professor Cook for honoring me with this Peacemaker Award, which I would like to dedicate to every one of you. And I would like to dedicate it also to my country, Jordan, who helped me throughout my career at the United Nations. I would also like to dedicate it to every woman and every man who work in very difficult regions in the world marked by violent conflicts, wars, and who sacrificed their families and their lives to transfer war to peace, injustice to justice, promoting understanding between peoples and nations. What a privilege to celebrate with you the International Day of Peace, to celebrate this important day on this campus, in this center, I think I am in the right place and among the right people who exert all efforts to, to transform conflict on campus and throughout the world through mediation, arbitration, and other tools. And most importantly, fostering a better understanding of peace and empowering students and others in conflict resolution skills to build a better world of peace, justice, and development. I am privileged to have the opportunity to talk to you on the theme, Building a World of Peace, Justice, and Development, the important role of the international cooperation. This is based on my 30 years experience with the United Nations UNICEF and the Department of Peacekeeping Operations at headquarters in New York and serving in many countries in the world, including Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, as well as a member of the UN Secretary General High Level Independent Panel on United Nations Peace Operation. In addition, my colleagues and I are conducting at the Yale Child Study Center and in collaboration with Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and Lancaster University at the United Kingdom on investing in the early years of life to build stronger and more peaceful and cohesive societies. Allow me to start with my personal life. As, uh, and I started, before I started my career and my vision to participate in building an inclusive world, peace, justice, and development were shaped by my personal narrative. I was born or I was made a refugee, and I often asked my parents, what is a refugee? Why are we refugees? As a child, it was difficult to comprehend that we were different and what we could do to be part of normal life again. Despite being a refugee, my parents sacrificed a lot to ensure that my sisters and I received the best possible education. I also realized from a very young age that my family and my people were deprived of their rights and social justice. I believe that growing up in this context nurtured my passion to help people in need. At first, I wanted to become an international lawyer in order to defend the vulnerable and serve as their voice. But I ended up graduating with degree in social anthropology after conducting research for my doctoral thesis in Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan. I witnessed the terrible effects that war has on people's lives, particularly on women and children. And despite all this, I learned that more indicators are needed 
to capture the full extent of people's pain, loss, and sadness. It is also difficult to measure human dignity, moral courage, and wisdom. The people I met and lived with had tremendous strength, especially in the face of the many tragedies that they had endured. Their remarkable strength bore upon hope for a better future for their children, including access to quality education and a peace that would allow them to return to their cities and villages. They were also grateful to the care and assistance, assistance they received from Jordan and from the United Nations. Given my early wish to be part of a process to promote justice and improve people's lives, I felt that working with the United Nations, UNICEF, was really a fulfillment of a dream. As the United Nations Charter and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the CRC we call, provided an ideal con concrete platform for the pursuit of peace, justice, social progress, and particularly human rights. My service to UNICEF and later to the Department of Peacekeeping Operations took me to many, many parts of the world, including in Africa and Asia. They were marked by poverty and crippled by instability. So I joined UNICEF in 1987 in the era where child rights were steadily gaining ground. The Convention on the Rights of the Child was ratified by the UN General Assembly in 1989. It was the most comprehensive statement of children's rights ever produced and the most widely ratified international human rights treaty. It is comprehensive because it includes civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social as well as cultural rights. And universal in that is that it applies to all children. All governments must take action to protect all children's rights. Children's rights are all essential. They are interdependent and they are equal. You cannot achieve one right if you don't achieve the other one. Yes, it was a new era. It was an era of new ethics for the protection and care of children. It was the era that confirmed that every child has rights, whatever his, her ethnicity, gender, religion, language, abilities, or any other status. It was an era that reaffirmed the advancement of society is inevitably linked to the well-being of children. It was an era of hope and action for children that had potential to transform their lives. In the countries where I served, the UNICEF teams and partners worked together to surmount all difficulties and barriers that hinder the realization of the rights of children. As such, we mobilized governments, parliaments, regional entities, religious leaders, and civil societies. We advocated that the greatest and the most profitable investment for basic services in health, education, and protection. For example, in the West and Central African region, a national mechanism was put for the monitoring of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And even some president had a card in their pocket with the Convention on the Rights of the Child so that they monitor and call their ministers if this right was not achieved. I was also in Vietnam for four years, and it was one of the first countries to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the first country to have a minister for children. And so this minister, when I was there, became an international advocate for the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I accompanied her in 1996, I remember, on a trip to Europe where she advocated for the universal ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Also at this time in Vietnam, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which is part of human rights, became the entry point for the UN system to speak in one voice for the re realization of all human rights in the country. 
So distinguished participant, much of the progress realized for the children in some of the countries seemed challenging, especially in those countries that were in situation of war, violent conflict, like Sierra Leone at that time, Liberia, Congo, Ivory Coast, Sudan, and others. In those countries, millions of families found themselves trapped in devastating situation, disrupting the fabric of their societies, and compromising the very foundation of their institutions, including the family. The impact of violent conflict on communities and families were tremendous and should never be tolerated. In addition to indiscriminate killing, maiming, appalling abuses were perpetrated against them and their children who were trafficked and enrolled as child soldiers and combatants. Women and girls faced the atrocities of sexual violence and exploitation, which included rape, sexual slavery, forced marriage, and trafficking. Sexual explo exploitation, as you know, was always used as a tactic of war and terrorism, destroying families, particularly attacking the dignity of every family and the humanity of every family. I met children who were traumatized, displaced, and orphaned, who had never seen a school in their lives, and spending their days in the simple joy of childhood. They were trapped and being combatants. I met 11-year-old John in Liberia, which is a country in Western Africa. He told me, I was made a soldier at six years old, and they gave us lots of drugs to make us feel strong and have to carry out all orders. But because of the UNICEF supported child soldier reintegration program, John went back to school after leaving the front lines. He was 11 years old then. At the hospital in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I met Safi who had experienced sexual violence. She said, when I arrived here at the hospital, I was crying a lot. I wanted to kill myself, but the people were very nice to me, and I met female counselors who talked with me a lot. To address the plight of girls like Safi, UNICEF provided the hospital in Congo with essential medicine and surgical materials, particularly including psychosocial services and social counseling, so that impacted on and integrated. The, the word integration, we, we can demobilize children, but it's very difficult, the integration. We call it the I, the integrate, how to integrate them back in their communities. Compelled by this grave situation of children and armed conflict, as the regional director of UNICEF in that region in West and Central Africa, and later as deputy executive director of UNICEF and other partners, we had to redouble our efforts to build a protective environment for children and conflict. Equipped with those international conventions and resolution, I started to negotiate with governments and non-state parties rebel groups to demobilize children from their armies. I visited military camps in Sierra Leone, Liberia, Congo, and later in South Sudan, and asked the responsible people to give me back the children. It was tough. They had all their arms with them. I had nothing except the badge of UNICEF with me. And, and they told me, if we give you back the children, where do you put them? Do you have a place to, what do you do here? You know, it was very tough because they were saying, we are protecting children, we are giving them food because their parents cannot give them. So they denied everything. When I said, but you have girls also in the camps, they said, no, we don't have girls. And then later they said, yes, they help us, they cook and do everything. So it was tough but I had to be ready with my teams to have the centers to put them in rehabilitation centers for psychosocial services. And then we uh, did the back to school campaigns and send them back to school. So at this time also, 
a, a groundbreaking resolution was adopted, 1612. I contributed to that because I was in headquarters in New York and talked to the Security Council of the United Nations and later advocated with governments, and particularly government that had child soldiers. So at last, after negotiation, Resolution 1612 was adopted in July 2005 by the UN Security Council, which ended impunity for those responsible for using children in armed conflict. This resolution and the subsequent one shed the light on six grave violations committed against children during armed conflict. They included recruitment and use of children, killing and maiming of children, sexual violence against children, attack against schools and hospitals, and abduction of children, and particularly denial of humanitarian access. And we have it until now, those six violations. It also established a monitoring. It's very important when you have a resolution to have a monitoring system to report on this. So a monitoring and reporting mechanism to provide for the systematic gathering of accurate, timely objective and re reliable information on the six violations with the Secretary General of the United Nations had to report to the Security Council. So it was like naming and shaming because the list of the countries and the rebel groups were put and you know, distributed to the, in the United Nations. Hence, the struggle for justice and accountability for wartime atrocities committed against children started to receive international attention also through the work of the, you know, the, the the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, uh, Tribunal, and National Courts. There were national courts in the country, but the Reconciliation Commissions, where sometimes children were allowed to, to say what they went through, but of course UNICEF uh, protected them. And also the adoption of the Rome Statute, and particularly, maybe you have heard, the establishment of the International Court the ICC in The Hague in July 2003 was a major achievement in ending impunity. What is heartening, many of who were accused of committing atrocities against children are now prosecuted and have been in prison in The Hague for the last 20 years. And this is really very heartening. Distinguished participants and students, the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Children in Our Conflict, Ms. Virginia Gambas, who's now the special representative, uh, representative, whose office and mandate was created 25 years ago. Now she continues to spearhead all efforts to protect children during conflicts. In her annual report just recently, uh, published in July 21, she recalls that 2021 marks the 25th anniversary of the resolution by which her mandate was created, but she encouraged the international community to use this important milestone to, that the protection and children must be prioritized on the international agenda to ensure sustainable development and maintain global peace and security. The UN Secretary General, the present one, uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres, says on several occasions, violence against children in situation of war and conflict is a threat to peace and security. We have to stop war because of children, as he always says, and we, have, we don't have to start, to start war because of children. So, as you know, Maintaining peace and security in the world is at the heart of why the United Nations was created. That was more than 76 years ago. It was born in the aftermath of two wars, devastating wars, which caused immense destruction and killed millions of people. In its charter that was signed by member states not far from here in San Francisco, 
in 1945. It says, we the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generation from the scourge of war and worth of the human person in the equal rights of men and women and nations large and small. Further, they say to promote social progress, better understanders of life in larger freedom and to unite our strength and to maintain, maintain international peace and security. So amidst this adversary, uh, this decades of the Cold War, the Cold War, the nuclear war that came after, and regional conflicts, the peacekeeping, you heard of the peacekeeping mission, became a predominant concern of the United Nations. And the activities of the blue helmeted peacekeepers have emerged among the most visible growing up and myself, I had this experience, even growing up in East Jerusalem, the Blue Beret became part of my life and my family life and my community. They gave us and they gave me a sense of protection and safety because they were there in East Jerusalem. In 1948, the United Nations deployed the first peacekeeper mission to the Middle East, uh, to India, and to Pakistan. In the many succeeding missions across the world, peacekeeping was primarily limited to maintaining ceasefires in the beginning and stabilizing situations on the ground, providing crucial support for political efforts. But later, the UN peace operations became more integrated. They included peacekeeping and special political mission as well the good offices of the UN Secretary General and particularly mediation initiative. The operation became central to the organization peace and security efforts. Member states have turned increasingly to those tools like mediation and other to address evolving threats to peace and security in their countries. For over more than a quarter of a century now, millions of committed women and men, military and civilian, have deployed across the globe, serving peace under the blue flag of the United Nations. In 2008, I had the privilege to be deployed to a mission called Minurkat. It was in Chad and in Central African Republic. It was, this peace operation, uh, Chad is a country in Central Africa, and since its independence from the French, Chad had faced recurrent violent conflict and political instability, which hindered the emergence of strong state institutions. We know to have peace and justice, we have to have strong state institutions and, de in, and democratic governance. And in 2006, rebel and criminal activities, as well as the inter-ethnic clashes, were plaguing the eastern region of the country with reports of looting, mass displacement, widespread uh, physical violence against civilians. The situation was further aggravated at that time from the neighbor, uh, neighboring Sudan. There were many refugees from the Darfur region. So, in 2006, the UN Security Council in its resolution, because those missions are deployed uh, or permitted by the, by the UN Security Council. So our mission was permitted to go to Chad, consisting of political, humanitarian, military, civilian police, liaison officer, and including in refugee camps and internally displaced people's side. So our main mission, mission was to restore the rule of law. And I'd like to emphasize, because you are students of law, so the rule of law is very important to build peace in a country. So the, the first thing that the United Nations do when they go to a country is to protect civilians in danger and facilitate also the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And, and where do we get all the people, you know? You know, the blue berets, as we call them, the, the blue helmeted peacekeepers, come from all over the world. Uh, from Jordan, from Egypt, from Lebanon, from Colombia, from Bangladesh, 
and also technical support from the United States. So in my capacity as the Deputy Special Representative at that time of the Secretary General, I oversaw the mission work on the rule of law, which included the Judicial Advisory Unit, the Human Rights Section, and the Prison Advisory Unit. In addition, I also foresaw the work of the Gender Equality Unit as well the Civil Affairs Section. So supported by professional teams, as I said, and those teams come from all over the world, and that is the strength of the United Nations. It comes like people, when you graduate, and you, you, it's wonderful to join those teams, Te composed of experts in international law, in justice, in corrections, in human rights, and of course gender, as well as conflict resolution. We, achieve a lot, we achieved a lot in the period of three years. We had three years. Uh, most importantly, the mission supported the government of Chad to create 850 Chadian police. Uh, they were in French called gendarmes. And they were trained by police from all over the world, international police from Northern Europe, but mostly also from Arab countries because the language is Arabic there. So Jordan sent many police people to help and also Egypt. In fact, to just to tell you that Jordan and G Egypt, because we visited their schools of policing, they have very strong uh, schools for, to train police. And the police were trained most importantly in human rights in children's rights and in women, of course, women's rights. And they were supposed uh, to maintain uh, uh, law and order in camps, in the internationally uh, displaced people, the, the IDPs we call them, and also in towns and in region. The judicial advisory team worked in close collaboration with the Ministry of Justice to reinforce justice in the whole of Chad, to report its efforts toward the strengthening of judicial capacities, facilitating access to justice for all. Justice for all is very important, including to refugee population with a special focus on vulnerable groups, women and children, and really towards the harmonization of the justice system with legal institution. It also provided technical support. At that time, we had mobile courts that went from one region to the other. So the, the job of the United Nations was to support those courts. The hearings, the trained and trained uh, in Chad, they have non-professional judges, you know, the cultural uh, part of the, the country. And we trained, we call them les juges de paix, the judges of peace. And they helped in the creation of mobile legal aid clinics. It's very important to have legal aid clinics. I don't know if here you have, yeah? Legal aid clinics in all villages, in all cities. So the, the people, every woman, every child or can go to those uh, legal aid. Um, and the, the, at the prison, and then the prison. We had also to reform the prison. So the prison advisory team worked with their national partners for the rehabilitation and humanization of prisons, taking into account concerns such as gender and age, separating minors from adults and males from females. It also provided training and mentoring and capacity building to prison officers. So I had to uh, go and meet and visit those prisons. And it was so important to train the prison, you know, the officers that were there. I didn't train them myself, but I had the expert to, to train them. Uh, so the, the human rights team. Now, the rule of law is not complete without human rights, right? So the human rights team carried out a monitoring. I had many, many, uh, like maybe 20 human rights officers that came from Geneva and other places, but from all countries in the world, that went to refugee camps and went to village and cities and monitored human rights. Because at that time in cities, in 
particularly in camps, when women went to fetch water or to fetch wood, and sometimes they were, uh, you know, encountered, they encountered difficulties and sometimes sexual, sexual violence. So in training the police, I went on television and I said in Arabic that we need women police, we need women. And uh, even if they, ha they don't have the right training before like men, so we trained also women, women police because you know as women and children, they, have more, they can go more and talk about their problems uh, to women, uh, to women police. So here in the United, whenever I see a woman police, I say, that's great, that we, we need people uh, like you. So, um, and then the most importantly is the civil affairs team which promoted reconciliation activities and supported the creation of conflict resolution mechanisms. So we went to the villages and brought two villages together that were, in, and sometimes you know what is the, the cause of the difference, for example, access to water. Mm? Sometimes this is, can bring problem between two villages and some even villagers had to leave their villages. So we went there and we had those sessions, like you have also, sessions in uh, conflict resolution. I remember, you love, I like women now, uh, the ladies here. When I went the first time to the village, they were all sitting, so they had uh, the, the representative of the villagers. So the men were in front and the women were all in the back. So I said this, no, they, they are your, your mothers, your sisters, your daughters, so please let them also be with you in the front. So the next time when I went from far, I could see all the women sitting in, in front, which, which is good because that respect is also very important. And especially in our part of the world, respect of women is very, very important. So it was, and because of our, uh, you know, all these efforts, villagers went back to their, uh, you know, some of them, they felt secure and went back to their villages. And of course, with all this, it's good to have programs like humanitarian programs, like because this village and this village, they are uh, you know, in conflict because of, uh, of water, the United Nations with other United Nations agencies, we can put water also, uh, you know, and uh, have, so they may, might have access more to water and other services. So it's all, the humanitarian also works with it. And the, the, uh, so as I said it always, our goals were ambitious because we had to do this in three years because we wanted to close the mission because it's good to close the mission and leave it to its people, to the country, then to take care of it. So our, um, they were ambitious, but I always say nothing is too ambitious for the cause of peace and justice and to give hope to people who had lost hope in humanity. They really lost hope in humanity. And it's very important we cannot build peace if we do not have, you know, if we not, do not have justice. So as you know, this last decade we witnessed a rise now. We have in violent conflict that are becoming more complex and, and uh, in, protracted, involving more known sta state groups. Most importantly, they'd be coming threats to global peace and security. And this compelled then the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in his resolve to build a United Nations that is more fit for purpose. He assigned 16 people to a high level panel. I was one of this, uh, the 16 and we went and talked, we went to all uh, let's say all the countries of the world, I mean the regions of the world, not every country, the continents, what we call. We went to all four countries to talk to governments, to reg regional uh, groups, but most importantly to people. What do people expect from international community? What do people expect from the United Nations? And what we heard was sometimes good. Yes, the United Nations is a beacon of hope, and for others, no. You come with your big cars, white cars with UN, but what does it do to me, a lady told me. So it has to be nearer to the people. So our, uh, uh, our um, report uh, was called uh, 
as, yeah, as I said, we can, and most importantly, the, we talked about that the UN should most importantly, the whole UN peace operation must be used more flexible to respond to the changing needs on the ground. And it has to be focused and be people-centered. So the report the, uh, to reinforce some, some core areas included the prevention of conflict, which you do here, and the mediation of peace, the protection of civilians, and sustaining peace. It's very important to sustain peace. And it will become more uh, as uh, then, uh, it is only then that peace operation will become more responsive and more relevant to the need of member states and millions of people living in situation of conflict. It is with this hope and determination then that the United Nations continues its journey, but doing some reforms. It needs reforms. I, I heard it on several occasions. And it, it, it's trying, and so many resolutions were, um, were adopted at the Security Council. Mostly, most important is the sustaining peace resolution. It's not enough to build peace, but how do you keep peace? How do you sustain peace, I think, is very important. And uh, also, of course, we have the, 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 the transformative agenda, uh, which all countries in the world have signed on to, uh, adopt, to achieve 17 goals, including ending poverty, education for all, justice for all. But most importantly, one goal is very important to all of you, is how to just peaceful and inclusive societies and how to build institutions that can support justice and cohesion. So, uh, and also, of course, we have the resolution now, which is very important about youth peace, women peace and security, youth peace and security, that we cannot sustain peace because without the youth now and without women. And it has been proved that when women are sitting on the around the table that peace can be achieved. So we are advocating a lot about the inclusion of women in peace mission and particularly to be sitting around, not only at the kitchen table, but around the, around the table to bring peace to the communities. Um, So all these efforts heralded a new era, a new vision for building peace and peaceful societies where people are at the center of peace and development. Uh, so this is an era of partnership with all members of societies, including families, children, in the service of peace. And they told us when we visited the, 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 the region, we are not only victims, but we can be also agents of change and drivers of peace in the communities. We cannot build peace without including members of the communities. All this inspired my colleague also now at Yale University and, as, and other organization to establish the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. Why we wanted, we agreed that it was time to raise the voice of science and the voice of we the people. The voice of we the peoples are important, but how can science help we the people? And so th there is an emerging and well-established scientific evidence from multiple disciplines like neuroscience, psychology, and economics that continues to substantiate the link between the early years of life and early environment with long-term well-being, violence prevention, and behavior linked with building peaceful societies. So the formative years of life, the first years of life are very important and they are powerful and they are powerful agents of change that can promote resilience, social cohesion and peace. The good news and hope is that the emerging science heralds a new era with windows of opportunity through investment in the positive early development of young children as a path to creating a culture of peace and sustaining peace at home, in the community and society. So we have every 
opportunity now to make this transformative shift and elevate the role of families and children on the peace and development agenda. So supporting and empowering them now can it's empower. When here in the, in the center you empower also students and others, for example, in the tools of conflict resolution, we have also to empower families and children on the peace and as to, so they can not only, when we do that, this can not only interrupt cycle of racial injustice, inequality, but build a strong foundation for peace and security, resilience, social justice, and social cohesion. In order to lay the foundation for a world of peace, justice, and development, we need the commitment of the international community. We need the commitment of leaders. We need in putting the interest of communities, families, and children in the heart of all our peace building efforts. We need international and national actors to rethink strategies and program, like we always do, rethink what can we do better. So to make them more people-centered, where communities can play an important role in decision-making. As you see, the task to build a world of peace, justice, and development is formidable as it was even told this week recently by the Secretary General, but there is room for optimism because each one of us is responsible. Each one of us is responsible. It is our shared responsibility. We need greater commitment from every one of us, and most importantly, a greater involvement. It's not enough to say, yes, I know it's important, but I think Greater involvement is very important. And to be here, this great campus and the very distinguished university is known, this uni known for its academic excellence, its commitment to prepare responsible citizens, and all the work you are doing in the center to build peace on campus and beyond is very important. And it's very important as we are in a this establishment to emphasize the role of universities and academic institution in advancing peace. I mean, it's no more the time to say we are universities, we are, no, the role of universities, academic institutions are very important to join also to advance peace in the world. I think there is no better time than now to, to unite our strength to change the tide of violence and build a peaceful world for us and the generations to come. We owe it to them, and I think the time is now. It will be very late. It's the time is now, and we have to do it now. I thank you very much. raise your hand and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and call on you and if you can just stand up and, um, and say who you are and, and, uh, and ask your question.
that women are, when women are there, they can talk more about the situation of children and other, and it has been proved. Now, I think in New York, there will be an exhibition of, I don't know how many, 15 women that were part of the peace, uh, of the peace negotiation and how they achieved a lot, among them Philippines and, and others. So we need every one of us to advocate that the role of women and children as agents of change is very, uh, very important. So we have to shout it everywhere we are. It's very important to have mothers and sisters and daughters to be part of, of, uh, of, that, uh, of the negotiation. Because, you know, even in the UN, uh, we were before, uh, when the peace operations used to go, they used to think that now they sign among the warring parties, you know, that peace there. But peace has to trickle down. Peace has to trickle down to the communities, to the villages. They have to feel that there is peace in the country. And this is uh, also, for example, in Colombia, and at the UN we thought that what it was wonderful, but still there are problems in the Colombia when they did the peace agreement, because it did not trickle down uh, to every family, to every, that they know that now there is peace in the country and they have to, you know, to get along <coughs> together. So we should continue to do that. There are many uh, resolutions now about women and men. Like I am uh, a member uh, of the board of the Global Network for Women Peace Builders, and uh, we have an office in New York, but the network is everywhere, like in, uh, in every country. And uh, it, has, it is having uh, its results because they are supported. They have to be uh, supported. And now, in countries now, when we say sustain peace, some countries, they tell you, but we don't have war in our country. Yeah, I remember some of the countries. Yes, we don't have, but you have to sustain that peace. It's very important to keep this cohesiveness in the society. Mm -hmm. um, so earlier you gave an example of a woman who... I can't hear you. Maybe I'm... I'm yeah. Earlier you gave an example of a woman who... Uh, would have seen the UN van come, and the woman would go, well, that says UN on it, but it doesn't really help me personally. Um, how do you affect a change in the culture of the local communities to actually make it more um, equal for women and children and make it more, like, uh, make it more effective for them and fair for them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so it is, that is why that advocacy is at all, at all levels. So I think when I went to those villages and talked to those men, and they said, are they going to be like you then? Then we approve, because we really approve for what you do. You have to be a role model. As a, as a woman from the same culture, or almost, it is good to be a role model and to show them that it is good, that it is positive. So we have to advocate. Education is very, very important. And that's why UNICEF and the UN system work a lot on education for girls, particularly, is very important. We establish schools and we train teachers, for example, in different parts of the world. So advocacy should be at all, and it is not a matter of one day or two days uh, to, to affect the country and the culture and all this, but it needs time and efforts. And we need all of us, not the peacekeeping, the peace, but the whole UN system, the non-governmental organization, and all what is being done for, for the people. And the role models of men and women, uh, you know, is very important. I think one more question. Yeah. And then, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering a little bit more about your personal story and how you went from being a refugee in Jerusalem, was it, to working for the UN? Well, uh, about my experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in Jerusalem, which was Jordan, before Jordan. Uh, yeah, the experience was good because I uh, felt at that time, I mean, as I said, we feel that when people are refugees and other, there is a lack of justice there, that something else. So that, that experience helped me a lot, helped me a lot, and of course, all the access to education and uh, that, that I had was very, very, uh, very important. And the role model that I had in my life also were very important. But it's when you come from uh, a background, like when you see the, the havoc of wars and conflict, 
And I think you are determined to change it. And you are determined to bring justice to the people. As I said, that, and we always say, there is no justice without peace, and there is no peace without justice. We have to have justice to everyone, and particularly the dignity of every human being in the world. The dignity is very important. Thank you so much.